one of 18 chart hits recorded by the California-based harmony group The Association and their second million-selling number one hit single. That was Windy, of course, on the vintage rock and pop shop. Their first million-selling single was the hit song Cherish, which is also the title of a new biography of the group written by our guest today, author Malcolm C. Searles. The full title is The Association Cherish, The Story of America's First Folk Rock Band. Malcolm is a returning guest to the program. He was on back in 2016 to talk about his three-volume history of Beach Boys album sleeve artwork. Malcolm, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here way across the Atlantic. Now, unlike last time where we were talking about a series of, of Beach Boys books that were internet only, this time your book on the association is a, a physical product that uh, people can hold in their hands. It is indeed. 456 pages worth of it, and it's quite a hefty tome. But yes, I'm really pleased to see that it's finally out in publication form. As much as I love the Beach Boys, the book that I did, it's so good to actually hold this one in your hand. Absolutely. And I want to ask, because you're British, obviously, and here in America, the association had a number of big hit singles and a successful career during the 1960s, and I'm wondering if it was the same for them in Great Britain. Completely the opposite. Bizarrely... Uh They only had one hit here in the UK, and that was 1968, when Time for Living came out as a 45. So all the big ones that came out in the States, i.e. Cherish, Along Comes Mary, Never My Love, didn't make a dent over here in Europe. And that I've always found immensely frustrating. I can't believe that we missed such a fantastic band over here. Well, if that's the case, then how did you discover the association? Well, it kind of leads through from my love of the Beach Boys and Harmony music. Um, I picked up on the association during their reunion period, I'm ashamed to say almost, which was the 80s. <laughs> I missed out on the early decades. And my love of the Beach Boys made me explore a little bit more about West Coast Harmony. And I'd heard about this group and I found this, this reissue album that came out in the UK in about 1980 and it had a lot of their early stuff on there and it just it just hooked me from there. And I've collected i've followed them for 20 30 odd years now and 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 yet there's never been anything definitive written about them so again i took the bull by the horns and decided i was going to be the one to do it let's talk about the title for a second the association the biography cherish the story of america's first folk rock band and i noticed on (laughs) facebook that there were some people who were you know, craning, that. yeah, craning their necks and going, what? Folk rock? I never thought of them as folk rock. Can you elaborate a little bit on that uh, subtitle? Of course I can, of course I can. The association aren't particularly known, firstly, for being a folk rock band when you think about the hits. They're known for the sunshine pop of Never My Love and Windy. But if you go right back to the beginning of their career, they they formed in sort of 64, early 65, Um which was the same time that the birds were coming together, the same time that the MFQ right. were, were plowing their trade. And yet before the association formed, there was a group called the Men. And even before that, there was one called the Inner Tubes. The Men were a 13-piece vocal band that for the first time in the Los Angeles era, they electrified themselves. And yes, I'm not hmm. denying that McGuinn and... McGuinn and Maguire, for want of a better way of putting it, were doing right. similar, similar, similar feats at the same time. But the but the the, uh, the men were the first band that kind of took it out to the public. It was literally weeks, potentially days, before the Birds did the same, the MFQ did the same. But it, but in my heart, the association got there just just pipped them to it, or the men did rather. And then the men collapsed and evolved into what became the association, and that was the first folk rock movement. And gradually, as they became more popular, the sound developed. They got a slicker sound. Two albums came out. Then they took on board Bones Howe as a producer and produced the third album, which is the sunshine pop sound that, that lingers to this day. But I like to think of them far, far more than just that. And that'll lead us into the first of three standout tracks from the association that I asked you to uh, pick out. So let's begin with number one. Number one is the Jules Alexander composed Pandora's Golden Heebie Jeebies. Um, Great song. From the second album, but it was the one that didn't really take off. Everybody thought it was going to be the big hit after right. the success it had previously, but it didn't take off. But it's an, a wonderful piece of music. 
really inventive, musically perfect as far as I'm concerned. They were playing everything on this second album themselves. And you listen to that and you tell me that's not a band that can't cut it. That is an incredible piece of music. So yes, Pandora's Golden Heebie Jeebies is number one choice. We're talking with author Malcolm Searles. His new book on the association is called Cherish, the story of America's first folk rock band. And you mentioned that shift from folk rock music to sunshine pop, for lack of a better term. And was that something that the group was pushing for, or was that the influence of their new producer, Bones Howe? I think it was a mixture of both, to be perfectly honest with you. Jules Alexander had left by the time the third album came out. He decided that he wanted to uh, have a little bit more privacy. He wasn't keen on going on the road. And Larry Ramos had come in, and Larry had a much more of a commercial approach. Incredibly, incredibly talented guy. Of course, he'd come from the New Christian Minstrels, an incredibly talented guy. And with him on board, they almost developed a little bit more of a commercial approach. And certainly with Bones Howe, um, the band's manager at the time, Pat Colesio, he encouraged Bones to come on board. And together they kind of pulled this sound together that became known as this part of this sunshine, sunshine pop movement. Personally, I don't think they really were a sunshine pop band. I think they just got caught up in the movement of it. And they produced two amazing albums during that period. I believe I've heard you say that it's taken you two years to put this, this book together. It, it has, yes, which is, which is nothing compared to my first book, which came out right. when I did David Gates and Bread. That, that took five years from beginning to end. So this one took two years. But I'm, I'm thrilled to say that I had great help along route. Jules helped. Jim Yester was very incredibly helpful. Terry Kirkman. I had a conversation with Terry that went on for about two and a half hours. And so, so many people have contributed to this book that I can't thank them enough for it. And the 456 pages says it all, really. Having access to uh, a band members and associates of the association is obviously <laughs> a, good, uh, a good starting point. What in your research did you find the most surprising? I, I think it was that early period, you know. When I was researching the early years, I was finding that they were sharing the stage with with people like John Denver before he became successful. Right. John, John Deutschendorf, as he was known then. They, they, they were sharing the stage with all these people who became part of the musical establishment of L.A. music in the 60s. And I personally found that absolutely fascinating, learning about this, this the involvement of folk rock. But it wasn't just that, of course. Once the, the Sunshine Pop years had faded, they still put out some amazing material after the, the spotlight was turned off, shall we say. Their Stop Your Motor album, the Waterbeds in Trinidad album, both from the early 70s. And one thing I did find out, which isn't really perhaps too well known, was a soundtrack they did in 1970 to a TV movie, which was an incredible piece of music as well. Um, so you know, there is so there was so much out there, but I guess my greatest discovery was stumbling across on an online auction. Believe it or not, I came across the original master tape from their very first recording session from April 1965. Wow! Which some of the tracks have never surfaced before. These probably hadn't been heard for 50 years, and I can honestly tell you, my heart was beating ten to the dozen as my friend who runs a recording studio <laughs> popped it onto the tape deck. All right, number two, your second pick for a hidden gem in the association's catalog. Number two, we're going to jump forward to the first, or the fifth album, rather, the first one when they decided to take back their identity. And we're going to go for a Ted Blue Shell composition that he sings in partnership with uh, Brian Cole called The Nest. Very overlooked, hmm. but it's almost in two parts. The first part is really serious, Brian developing, or delivering, rather, in a really serious tone, and then Ted comes in for the second part that's almost Beach Boy-esque in its harmony. It's almost Beach Boy-esque in a friend's vein. And people who have followed the Beach Boys will know what I'm talking about. Right. Great, great song. Stay tuned, folks. We'll be back to wrap up our conversation with author Malcolm Searles, and then later we'll have Jules Alexander from the Association on the program. But we'll be back right after this charming... Retro Marshall. Thursday, November 20th. 
The classic Never My Love, right here on the Vintage Rock and Pop Shop. And once again, we're talking with author Malcolm Searles about his new book on the association called Cherish. And in just a little while, we'll be giving out a pair of tickets to see the association as part of the uh, Happy Together Tour, along with the Turtles, Chuck Negron of Three Dog Night, Gary Puckett and the Union Gap, Mark Lindsay of Paul Revere and the Raiders, and the Cow Sills. That's happening June 19th at the Bergen Pack in Englewood, New Jersey. Uh, I, I cannot deny, I remain completely envious of every American listener <laughs> who, who gets to see them, because they toured once over here in 1968, and other than individual personal private visits, fortunately I met up with Jules recently when he was over in London, Right. Um, but the band has not been across since 1968, and how frustrating is that? For us poor old Brits, this side of the pond. <laughs> well, yeah, well, maybe your book will change all that and start off a little association uh, mania in Great Britain, although it does appear to be that uh, there's quite a lot of interest from the United States in your book. It, it does indeed, it does indeed. I, I, I hope, I hope, touch wood, I'm touching wood now as we speak, <laughs> to get American distribution at some stage. I've only printed it in a limited quantities at the moment. This is a self-published book. I haven't gone the publisher's route like I did with my first book. Right. So I've got total control on this one, but obviously financial reasons are restricted how many I get printed. But if these ones get sell through completely, which I'm hoping it will, it's been a great response so far from the fan from the fan base. Then I can I can take it wider and get it to a wider market. That's that's the intention, because this band deserve to be recognised for what they've done. Indeed, Malcolm. As we start to wrap up here, let's get to your third and final association pick. My third one will be a Terry Kirkman composition from right towards the end of their original career, when it was the original band, and that's a song called Come the Fall. A beautiful song from, from Terry, which really shows the compositional development these guys had produced over the years. It's a really a masterful piece of music. So where would people go if, uh, in hearing this conversation, they decide they want to check out the book? Where would they go to order it? Uh, present, like I say, it's a, it's a privately published uh, item, but they can go direct to my own personal website, which is www.dojotone publications. Now that is D O J O T O N E, dojotone publications.com. And if there are any fans of the monkeys out there, well, they'll get the gist of where dojotone comes from. <laughs> if you go to the website, then all the writings that I have done, there are four pieces of work on there featured. There's the bread book, which uh, you have to go through the, um, the official publishers to get hold of that one, but right. it is still available. Then there's the Beach Boys one we discussed before, which was the album sleeves project. Mm -hmm. The free PDFs are still available on the, on the website. Then there's the association book available through the website. And there's a fourth little piece I've come up with on a group called the Yachtsmen. Now, not many people may know no. that, but 1960s Disneyland band, which developed and became a fascination for me, and that came about through my uh, research on the association. It's just a little sideline. It took me a little diverse route, but it's a fascinating little story there. So there's a nice little article on the Yachtsmen available on the website as well. So when is the uh, Cliff in the Shadows book coming? That's, that's what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> for listeners who are tuning in wondering why we've suddenly gone into that route but go <laughs> give myself a huge Cliff Richards fan and Absolutely. I'd love to do something with you one day yeah we'd just go album by album track by track indeed indeed it would be a joyful experience he's, he's, a, he's a great performer and he's still going strong Absolutely. Malcolm, I want to thank you so much for appearing on the show. The book sounds fantastic. And uh, thanks for all your uh, hard work in documenting these histories that up until this time, uh, I mean, especially the Yachtsman, I mean, that's probably the most obscure of all, uh, <laughs> up until this time had not really been covered. So we appreciate it. No, it's been my pleasure. And who knows what the next one will be. So stay tuned. In just a few moments, we'll be giving away a pair of tickets to see the association play that song in concert as part of the uh, Happy Together Tour on June 19th at the Bergen Pack in Englewood, New Jersey. But first, let's say hello to founding member of the association, Jules Alexander. Hello, hello. <laughs> well, 2018 is turning out to be a banner year for the association. You've got the tour, obviously, coming up, and you've also got this book about you, written by our friend uh, Malcolm Searles. Oh, yeah. The, uh, the group's in a very good shape nowadays. We're, we're having a good time. Uh, 
The book is just out. Uh, uh, I guess it's yeah, it's printed now. It's actually actually in distribution. All right. So that's really cool. He's been working on it for quite some time. And uh, yeah, we have a big tour coming up this summer. It's uh, the Happy Together tour. It's us, the Turtles, uh, Mark Lindsay, Gary Puckett, uh, Chuck Negron, the Cow Sills. Uh, uh, probably leaving out five bands. <laughs> 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 It's going to be a good tour. I just spoke with Malcolm about the folk rock origins of the association, and you guys were, in fact, the very first band ever dubbed folk rock. Yeah, well, that actually, okay, the way the, way the band started, I'll nutshell it because it's a very long story. There was a band previous to the, uh, the association. Uh, it was called The Men. It was... Uh, a folk rock band, in fact, it is, is said to be, and I kind of think it's accurate, it was the first band that was ever tagged folk rock by Doug Weston, who was the person that put it together. Doug owned the Troubadour in L.A., a club where we used to all hang out and play folk music. And he put together this this band because he wanted something to beat the Christy Minstrels. <laughs> he, okay. he, got, he wanted, and so we had, uh, all of us were, were folk players when he put us together. And uh, it sounded pretty good because we were pretty good singers and we we're all pretty good players. But a couple of us said, "Hey, we 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 all all of us knew how to play electric instruments." And one of the guys was a drummer, and one of the guys, a couple of the guys, the bass player was. Like, let's just do this. Let's just let's just put these in and see what happens. And uh, we did that for a couple of times, and bang, we were folk rock. We were doing folk music, and we just put rock and roll stuff to them, drums. We had, I think we had three basses on stage at one time. <laughs> Two basses and electric, and one electric. So that's really where it started, in L.A. Was it the influence of the Beatles that uh, inspired you to go electric? Oh, no. No, it was its own thing. Uh, uh, we, we really didn't like the Beatles at the time. I came to really like them later on, but... First, I didn't think much about the Beatles. They were okay, but musically, it didn't knock me out a whole lot. And um, Roger McGuinn and I once had a conversation. We were actually, he came out to my apartment one time and he brought a Rickenbacker 12. And he said, You know, he says, This is the folk music of today. And it really hit me. I went, Wow, you're right. You know, we, we were playing these folk music, folk songs that were, you know, hundreds of years old. But, we, you know, he had already realized that although the birds had not put it together as a band, uh, that this was the folk music of today. So we said, OK, let's do that. I want to talk about your first hit single, Along Comes Mary, and the controversy that went along with that, because a lot of radio stations banned it, thinking that it was a pro-pot statement. Some people saw it as just being an innocent song about uh, a girl. I mean, you could interpret it many different ways. Yeah. I remember we had some nuns came up to us one day and said, oh, thank you for the song about Mary. And I, okay, cool. <laughs> you know? Uh, so everybody read into it what they wanted to read into it, you know, uh, and that's really the reality of the song. I think I think Tandon wrote it that way. You know, I think, I think I can just see him writing it and giggling. You know, thinking, "Ha ha." Sweet as a punch. We're talking with Jules Alexander, founding member of the association today on the Vintage Rock and Pop Shop, and I'd like to uh, discuss the various fluid membership of the association because it seems as if. A lot of you sort of, you know, you're in for a little while, then you maybe leave and do a side project, then come back, or one guy leaves and another guy replaces him, and then he comes back, and it's almost like the mafia, you know? It's like once you're in, you're in. I don't, I don't know how else to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, it, that's really true. Uh, gosh, I mean, I, 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 we could go away and come back, and I know I did a couple of times. Uh, yeah. Russ did. Um, gosh, it, yeah. Jim did. Right. It was one of those things, yeah. And everyone was always just welcome back in. Oh, you want to come back in? Okay, let's do it. Now we're a 15-man band. You know? Right. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was very familial, that band. It still is. You, know? you guys are known for your exquisite studio creations, but my favorite album from the association is your live album huh, from no 1970. Kidding. I just, I love that record. Oh, thanks. There's an energy to it. Obviously, yeah, because well, it's live, yeah. 
we did that up at uh, in in Utah at uh, Brigham Young University. One take, one time through. That was it. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it was done on a gee, I think a sixteen track, which was huge at the time. Right. Uh, uh, Wally Hyder, the there was a recording studio named Wally Hyder's. And they had like one of the very few uh, recording trucks around. They'd taken a big old semi and put a recording studio, all the tech stuff in it, and they brought it up there, and we did it that way. Everybody on raise. Great concerts happen in cities like New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, or the Association. It happened in Salt Lake City. The association has been actively touring for decades now, and you guys sound great in concert. So, are there any plans to record uh, any new live material? That's I'm not going to say it's in the works, but uh, that is that's on the boards. Okay. <laughs> okay, because it would be great to have a sequel. All right, maybe possibly. Yeah, maybe possibly. That's yeah. I've got a little studio in my backyard. The other guys are really strong recorders and. You know, so that's that's not out of the realm of possibility. Hey, do you have any fond memories of appearing on all those TV shows the association did back in the '60s? Because there were so many appearances on YouTube, you must have done hundreds of TV shows. Oh, we did a ton of them. They were not many fond memories <laughs> because <laughs> the way you you know how TV works, you're in and you're out. You go in and and blah blah, and you get out. Uh, uh, real fast done. They get you in and get it out. So it's just real quick. I do remember playing with playing on the Tom Snyder show though. Uh, he was, for those that don't know, he had a late night show. This guy, oh, back in the uh, early seventies, real cool show, real nice, real a real good guy. And he had us on, and he let us run the board, the, the sound board, oh. because at that time. All the all the, the the TV speakers were the size of a nickel, and it, no matter what you did, it was going to sound bad unless you played the record and lip sync to it or something like right. that. Well, what we had is we said, "Look, let us do the we'll do the tracks because that's hard to to uh, to do live, but we'll sing it live." And he he said, "Okay, we'll do that." So our guy went in I went into the studio. In fact, it was Dale Ramos who's now in the band. And he mixed it right there as we were singing it. So he knew what a rock and roll mix was about, which the other the, the regular TV people didn't. They had no idea. I mean, right. They just had no, no background in it. So, so that, that was really cool. And it really sounded good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. I'm, I'm going to tell you a quick story. I, I mean, it actually goes back to the Beatles. When they were on the Ed Sullivan show, I don't know if you heard this story or not, the very first time they did a rehearsal and they were working with the sound guy to make sure they sounded good and they had him with a grease pencil mark on the board like where they wanted this level and that level for that yeah. mic and everything and they left and went had, went to have dinner and when while they were out having dinner the cleaning lady came in and erased oh. all the marks on the board oh my god <laughs> you know i would not be surprised a bit if that's a real story yeah yeah <laughs> yeah god you want to talk about this second and i guess third or fourth wave of uh, the association because i guess it was sometime in the mid 70s or so so the band, well, I don't know how you would put it, but I guess went on hiatus and then came back, and you've kind of been going strong ever since. Well, actually, it, it never did break up. It was There was somebody out there, that, that at least one person from the band was in the band but ever since we started. You know, right. uh, uh, so it, it never really, really went away. It just sort of uh, submerged a while, submarined. So, and then, uh, yeah, slowly, sometimes slowly, one time. Well, we did a TV show. Terry Kirkman was uh, was out of the band, and he was writing for uh, uh, TV writing. And they got to do a, uh, they were going to do a TV show and said, hey, you guys want to come back and just do this gig? And, and we'll do a TV show. And, and he, he said, well, yeah, sure. Uh, let's do it, do it. And we came back, and we sat down on the first rehearsal, it was like one, two, three, four, and everybody remembered every part and every note from years before that. And it was <laughs> so stunning, man. We said, let's think about something here. So we said, let's think about putting it back together. So we were all into different things. And it took I, I, maybe four months after we decided to uh, put it back together with all of us 
before we could do it because we were all into different things and you know had commitments elsewhere and, and uh, uh, when, when we did that though that was it we just knew that was you know, the right thing to do sort of how did you get involved with the happy together tour oh we've known the turtles forever we did the first happy together tour in 84 oh wow yeah it was done actually before that under a different name uh Oh, the hippie, happy hippie, something or another. Right, okay. And it, it didn't go so well. So uh, they changed it to the Happy Together Tour, and it was us, Gary Puckett, uh, Spanky, uh, and the Turtles. And uh, we did the tour in that, and then uh, we were out for a long time, and then we started playing again, I think 2012, where the first time we came back, and we've done it now, I think, three, four times. This will be the fourth since uh, uh, 2012, I think. Yeah, because that tour has now become something of an institution every summer. Oh, it is It is a, it, it is really a fun tour from our point of view also. You know, I mean, it's a, it runs so well. And it's fun. It's people, everybody in there, we've, we've all known each other for half a, half a century. Right. And so it, it's, everybody's pretty good friends, so it's a, it's a laugh riot. <laughs> every, every time I, I see the lineup, I go, this is like an episode of Hullabaloo or something. Yeah, I, I think it may have been, actually. <laughs> so where can people catch up with you and, and what the association is doing uh, presently? Uh, we have a website. It's called the association website, of course. That's what it's like. Right. And uh, that's got a, uh, the list of all the things we're doing right now. And uh, that's that's the best way because it's got a good list of all the, the shows we're doing and some other stuff, you know, past shows and pictures and this and that and the other. And I would imagine Facebook as well. And yeah, there's a there's a I think several sites on on Facebook. There's an association page on Facebook. And uh, uh, well, well, Malcolm's on Facebook also. Yeah. You know, he's got that going. Well, speaking of the Happy Together Tour, which will be taking place all over the country, but June 19th in our area at the Bergen Pack in Englewood, New Jersey, you can see the association along with the Turtles and Chuck Negron of Three Dog Night, Gary Puckett in the Union Gap, Mark Lindsay, formerly of Paul Revere and the Raiders, and the Cow Sills. And that's on June 19th, again, the Bergen Pack in Englewood, New Jersey. And we've got a pair of tickets to give out right now. Cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'll take a random caller at 201-692-2012. Once again, 201-692-2012 to go see the Happy Together Tour June 19th at the Bergen Pack in Englewood, New Jersey. My thanks to you, Jules Alexander, for appearing on the show. Thanks so much for spending some time with us, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks a lot. My pleasure, man. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.